Good Sunday evening, America. Welcome to Water Break. We have special guest, former American Idol Cade Foyner, coming on the show and several Water Break teammates here to discuss why media is so strategic and why we have been dropping this ball. So grab your best scotch or Dr. Pepper, as you know, and enjoy the show. But first, uh, this episode is brought to you by Real Estate, Story Real Estate. Home is where you build your legacy, where traditions are started, seeds are planted, mills are shared, and stories are told. Home is where you fight and prepare to go out into the world. I, I said fight. I put fight in there. That's true. That's true. Finding the home that's perfect for your family is a big job. Story Real Estate is Moscow's top real estate team. They give people real estate advice from all over the country. So don't just think Moscow. In our area, family homes, investments, land, new construction, or commercial, they know real estate. So if you've thought about a move to Moscow or anywhere in the country, reach out to get connected with a Story Real Estate agent. Wherever you're going, they can help you guide you home. Visit storyrealestate.com. So Cannonball or belly flop. Americans, we love our news. We love consuming media from TV to radio to podcasting to social media. We can we consume all kinds of media like a chubby fat kid at Golden Corral Buffet shoving hot dogs into the middle of an old-fashioned American apple pie. Call this have-it-your-way media, right? Well, you're probably watching this show while even, you know, cruising social media right now. You know, hot dog, meat, apple pie. When I talk, when I was talking to my wife about um, her thoughts on this, um, you know, kind of modern news and journalism, she said that she has zero trust in media, and that she was forced to go into kind of the underground world of podcasting to get information that that she thought was accurate. Our network um, here at Fight Laugh Feast gets millions of podcast downloads, probably because of the same distrust in media, which is why I'm sure you're even here tuning into Water Break right now. Mainstream media has opened the door big time for us, and I, I thank that media for the assist. Now, our Constitution enshrined freedom of speech and press into law, which is unprecedented for a nation to do. It really is. It really is. Think, you, you need to think about that. And I I've, am, 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 of course, glad for this, but with great freedom comes great responsibility. So with this great responsibility, we have to be thinking as we consume content um, which means we have to understand who's who's feeding us. So as we consume content, who who is feeding us this content? Who's cooking the food at the Golden Corral? I bet if you ask most journalists, they will claim to be some sort of you know centrist politi- politically, and and that they strive to you know be objective journalists. You know yada 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 yada. Uh, according to the Federalists, a 1982 survey from the state, uh, you know, you know, University of California, Los Angeles, which polled a thousand journalists across from 50 daily newspapers found that only 25% of those interviewed voted for then president Ronald Reagan, 25% more than a decade later, 1995, a joint study from university of Colorado's media studies center and Cornell university Roper center suggested Washington based bureau chiefs and congressional correspondents so they surveyed them and found that 89% voted for Bill Clinton in 1992. Only 7% of those surveyed journalists voted for George Bush, George W. Bush, or George H. W. Bush. And 2% voted for Ross Perot, who's Ross Perot these days. Half identified as Democrats and only 4% identified as Republicans. Back in the 70s, Republicans made up up to about 25% of all journalists. Democrats were 35% and independents were 32%. Uh, and then, of course, some 6% uh, were other. Now, by 2014, the year of the last survey, of this last survey that I could find, the share of journalists identifying as Republican had shrunk to 7.1%, which was a 18.6% drop. Democrats today outnumber Republicans today Four to one, and I think that number is even, even the greater disparity there. Now, the Center for Public Integrity identified 430 individuals working in journalism who made political donations between January 15th, uh, excuse me, January 2015 and August 2016, who was running for president. Well, you had Hillary Clinton running against President Trump. Uh, 96% of those journalists contributed to Hillary Clinton's campaign. And only 4% donated to Donald Trump's campaign. 
I have only been talking about liberal versus conservatives in journalism. What about Christian journalists? That is a hard nut to crack, but a 2007 Pew study found that 8% of journalists at national publications and 14% of those at local publications reported attending worship services weekly. Not good. And those numbers don't even break down, you know, Orthodox Christianity, let alone the difference in religious affiliation, Mormon, Muslim, so forth. The condition of the cooks in the kitchen, you know, at the Golden Corral, let's run with that, um, is not good. We are being served by cooks who don't know the difference between right and wrong, what is true and good. And in addition to that, most of them think you're racist, sexist, homophobic, and and they want to cancel you, fire, get you fired at your workplace, and run you out of town. But I think Christians have not understood the strategic value of media and how it could be used for driving narratives, creating culture, and, and discipling the nations. Think of this. Universal, Amazon, Netflix, Disney, well, and more. And they'll invest billions of dollars in entertainment in this year alone. Just recently, CNN invested $300 million in their failed launch of CNN+. Plus. And they have $700 million more million slated for CNN+. Plus. They had that saved up. And then, of course, you have, you know, uh, uh, Spotify's contract with Joe Rogan estimated around $100 million and more. Where are all the Christians at in all this? The best we can do is fund a $3 million Kirk Cameron movie, and even then, only those profits go to Sony. Media presents Christians with a huge opportunity, and we are dropping the ball. Uh, you know, you drop one podcast. And the whole world can listen to it. Just incredible. Uh, you know, this is behind the vision of the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. And the goal is to create Christ-centered content for the whole family, from cooking shows to hunting shows to sports coverage and, and our continued growth in news and media like shows like Cross Politic and, and Water Break. We have staked our ground in the U.S. and we are in the process of building our podcast network out in Canada and hopefully soon in the U.K. and beyond. And more Christians need to get engaged at all levels in this. We should not abandon this industry, but lean into it, take it over, and use it for God's glory. Now, my guest today is Cade Foyner. Cade Foyner is an American musician who's best known for his appearance on the 16th season of American Idol. 16 seasons, pretty incredible. Where he made it to the top five, congrats, Cade. Before he was eliminated, Cade met his wife, Gabby, on that same season. And they have a daughter with another one on the way. And I, I, you know, I'll, I'll be remiss if I don't ask uh, Cade if they're baptized. That's coming up. Cade is in the process of getting his degree in biblical theology from Masters University. So, uh, Cade, thank you for coming on the show, brother. Appreciate you being here. Yeah, brother. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Love, and, love everything y'all are doing, and I appreciate you. Thank you, Cade. And and Knox, you know, is making me ask this question. Um, but are your babies baptized? Oh, yes, they are. Well, the one in the womb has yeah. not yet been baptized, but I'm hoping for a John the Baptist situation where a leap at the womb at the reading of God's word and stuff. So <laughs> maybe that's happened. I'll have to ask Gabby if she's felt a flip at the uh, during communion or something. So <laughs> at the preaching of the word here in Jesus. That's yeah. great. Now yeah. let's let's start with your journey. Um uh, full uh, in into uh, music because uh, you were in music long before you went on American Idol. I'll start with your journey into music and then eventually into American Idol. Okay, um, yeah, I grew up um, in East Texas and I uh, rodeoed a bunch and just did farm life stuff, small town stuff. Did you do um, mutton races when you were younger? You know what. If I did, I don't remember. I do remember doing one where they let out a bunch of pigs into the rodeo arena and you had to go try to chase one down and grab something off its tail or something. No, I remember doing that <laughs> yeah. when I was little. But uh, I don't remember if I did. I don't think I did the mutton busting or nothing like that, I don't think. All right. One All of right. us probably did. One of the kids did. But, um, yeah, so I grew up in that that context, you know, super um, just your typical southern culture con context, small town, yeah. country music, um in Texas, Rodeo the promised land. land. Everyone knows the promised yes, land on our show. Yes. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Um, and so that's what that was my context, a little bit of it. Um, and then maybe middle school, 
I had a horse accident and I think that's what changed the chapters of my life from rodeo to music. I had a horse yeah. accident there and I don't know. It just seemed like that was the, um, the, if my life was in a book, it'd be the chapter division would go to music after that. Yeah. Um, not because I was scared or anything, just, I don't know. It just in my mind, that's where it goes. But yeah, after that, I wanted a guitar for Christmas. Um, as every kid eventually does one of the time. I, however, I just stuck with it. I really yeah. enjoyed it and really applied myself to it. Um, and just, I don't know, I got into the music culture as well. Just overall, I started listening to uh, Hendrix and, and uh, just all the more 60s and 70s rock bands. That was what I really liked at first okay. uh, yeah. because guitar-wise, I don't know, it just worked out. However, uh, worldview and theology there, uh, not so great. Um, <laughs> it influenced me, and I, I'm, I'm sad to admit uh, that in my high school years, I had so bought into this culture of, you know, existential rock and roll and bad yeah. worldview that I had a, uh, I'm embarrassed. This is not, this is, uh, I've repented of this. I had a patch on my pants that said, make love, not war. So I had so bought into it yeah. <laughs> that that's what I did. But um, Jesus is very kind to rebels. So, um, yeah. but I've continued to pursue it there and formed a band in high school and we toured as much as uh, we could, you know, we, we would play in every bar that would let 15 year olds in, you know, um, <laughs> wrote our own music, tried to record it in a little chicken shack that me and my old man made, uh, in the barn behind the yeah. house. And, um, yeah, just, I mean, you just kept pursuing it. I mean, that was all I did. You know, I didn't go out and really? hang out with anybody. Uh, that's, that's what I did all mm -hmm. the time. Sun up to sundown. I played music. Um, just, I mean, that's what I did, you know, yeah. um, I didn't didn't have many friends. The friends I did have were in my band, and I guess they yeah. were kind of tied to me. Um, yeah. But just kept pursuing that, and and then you know you I tried out for the Voice one time, didn't make it there, yeah. uh, and I tried out for American Idol one time as well, okay. and didn't make it, and then tried again when they brought the season back uh, okay. a couple of years later. They had you know they had finished with season fifteen or something like that, and then they right. brought it back a couple of years later on a different network. I tried out for that. And then, uh, yeah, it worked out. Yeah. Got my and wife. So, uh, <laughs> got my wife. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. So in yeah. 2018, you made it on American Idol. And it was, it was during that time where you met Gabby, because Gabby is on American Idol. And I believe right. uh, you, you got to the top five or got dropped off right before yeah. the top five. And Gabby made it to the top three. Yes. Yeah. We made it. I made it to, uh, they eliminated two of us at once. Gabby always says, I, it, you know, she was three, I was four. But I, the feller who got eliminated with me was a far better singer than I was. So, uh, you know, only my pride would want to say that I'm fourth. Uh, but we'll <laughs> stick with fourth, you know. Just yeah. for less sake, you know? That's funny. And, and then um, I remember talking to you about this. Um, and about that time, you started kind of getting more serious with your faith. You, you, you're, you, yes. Um, was, it, was it that kind of around the American Idol time where you started getting more serious with your faith? Well, I was, I was always, uh, um, I don't know, it, it, in high school, even when I was, had bought into, you know, just the, you know, against the man movement, because music influences, by the way, art does influence and it does reflect a worldview always. Yeah. Um, so, um, watch your kids, everybody just, just saying <laughs> I live that. So, uh, but, um, during, even during high school though, and stuff like that, everybody called me like brother Fainer Cause I would walk around passing out Bible verses all the time. I didn't know, I didn't know what they meant. I just knew that there was something there with this book. There's gotta yeah. be something there. Um, because it had so influenced everything around me to, uh, yeah. you know, and, um, really I started getting more serious maybe right after high school. I think I, what I tell people is I just started reading my Bible. Like yeah. that's, that's where all the dangerous stuff happens in a good way. You just start reading the word. That's right. And I did, I, I just dove in. I would um, devote myself to that. Just reading it, reading it, reading it, reading it. And through that, um, started finding my way to, you know, proper teachers. I started figuring out, wait a minute, there's a lot of people out there that are super famous in this of 
so-called preachers um, mm-hmm. who are not preaching what's I'm what's in this book. They, you know, it's just all a platform to talk about feelings and yeah, uh, I, you know, all that mess. Mm-hmm. So whittled down trying to find people who just expounded what was in the text and told me what God said, you know, yeah. and through that, through much digging, you start finding people like, you know, John Piper, the gateway drug into reformed theology, as they say, yeah, yeah, uh, to Johnny Mac. And then, mm-hmm. and then years down digging deep, I finally found Doug Wilson. Uh, he, <laughs> the embargo was still strong when I was first getting into yeah. good preaching. Yeah. Um, you know, and then through that, you and I connected through that right. whole avenue there, you know. Um, right. But that was, yeah, whole, so, whole, to, yeah. yeah, to back up, it was, yeah, it was, it, it, you know, you have in your life, you know, you have real deep dives into scripture uh, that really shape you. And it was, it bled over into my, the idol journey, um, but it really started right after high school, which was not too long before um, mm-hmm. the tv show deal yeah and so uh you know i remember uh um you you and gabby obviously from from season 18 you guys got married i remember mm-hmm. uh in 2020 you you had emailed me um oh man it must have been 2018 19 something like that i can't yeah. remember and mm-hmm. uh just, just uh out of the blue um emailed me and um said hey I, i'd love to help you guys in any way and you know we get those kind of emails all the time sure and uh I was like, oh man, I should, I should track this down and, um, you know, see what he's talking about. And anyways, I forgot to to respond to the email. And then I think an, a, a year later you'd emailed again and say, Hey man, just FYI, I would love to help you guys, uh, kind of thing. And I was like, Oh, I remember this guy. He emailed me before asking the same question. I was like, well, I'll, I'll track him down. And, and, and then I, I found out, you know, you're Cade Fainer and, and your wife's Gabby. And, and I was like, what is this guy doing reaching out? <laughs> you know, he's, yeah. he's going to get himself canceled reaching out to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. And yes. Then, I've had many close, close calls with death on this whole thing, but yeah, it's, we're still here. <laughs> yeah. Still, still there. God's good. And, uh, and then you guys were very kind when we went, when, you know, I got in 2020, when I got arrested, I was going out to, we we're doing the conference in, in mm-hmm. uh, Franklin and uh, uh, we had to, me and my wife had to come out a couple of days early for meetings and so forth. You guys, you and Gabby put us up. And that was, that was, that was a, actually a real blessing given what had happened in the yeah. last couple of weeks and kind of being able to get out of um, get out of town and being able to stay with you guys a couple of days. That was a real nice, um, peaceful oh, yeah. uh, time given what had happened in, in 2020 with my arrest. Oh, yeah. Um, how uh, so how are you kind of thinking about, you know, you know Gabby's um, uh you know, I don't know if it's number one or what you would call it, but she's doing really well in country music right now. Number one. Um, mm-hmm. and you guys are a very consciously Christian family in this mm-hmm. media world. Uh, and it has, and, and the world that you guys are in also hasn't been really known for its ability to kind of keep marriages together and growing in the sure, Lord and yeah. all that stuff. You know, how are you guys thinking about your time in the country music industry, uh, with also the success that God's given both you and Gabby? Yeah. Um, well, um, we really see it as obviously this is the moment God put us in, in his providence. Um, and he put us in the place he's put us in, mm-hmm. in his providence for mm-hmm. a reason. We're to be at our post, faithful there to his word. Um, you know, it, and it's interesting because a lot of people think, you know, once you make it, sort of thing where you're touring successfully and you're not, I don't know, you know, you're, you're in a phase to where it's, it's, it's easier to do versus traveling around in a van, yada, yada, yada. You know, there's still all sorts of challenges. They're just new. Um, You can get, I mean, I, for me personally, you know, you can get discontented and, and bored in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, But remembering that in God's providence, this is where he has you. He gives the increase, right? Yeah. It, it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't even matter how hard you try. Cause there's people out there who are far better guitar players than me, yeah. you know, just far better musicians. And, and they're still busting it and doing the whole thing. Right. But in God's kindness, he's chosen to elevate what we do. Mm-hmm. And, and so that helps. What is the word? 
it, it just helps us calculate moves and things like that because we're not af- particularly afraid to lose any of this stuff. Yeah. Because in his providence, he's the one who, who, who put us where we are. Right. So, you know, you got Joseph, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, he was faithful to God. He had his trials, but God can elevate um, a Christian. That's right. That's right. Um, and do what he will. And our job is simply to just be faithful at the post and let mm-hmm. him do the thing. I heard Doug talk about one time. He said, uh, it, it, and I've heard Vody talk about it as well, sort of the, um, you know, once I get to the spot, once I'm famous enough or, or successful enough, then I'll be openly Christian or, right. or then I'll start telling people about Christ. And That's then, right. well, the thing is, is that you're lying the whole way there. And so yeah. what makes you think that you're going to all of a sudden become consistent when mm-hmm. you've got all the, all, all the people who've bought into you right. sort of thing. And so like, uh, like I think I heard Doug say, if he, if they made him president, they should have no surprises in the wild right. three days that he is president. <laughs> you right. know? So, right. and that's, that's sort of the, the ideal that we've had since the beginning, obviously, you are to be wise as serpents, in, innocent as doves. So you don't, right? You don't want to be stupid, but you do go out guns a blazing in everything mm-hmm. you do, even in your wisdom of your. I'm going to hold back here. I'm going to be. I'm going to let it rip here with. Yeah. Um. I mean, any countless days. I did a speech for Gabby at some women's. I can't remember what it was called. It was women in music or something like that. And, you know, everybody was up there talking about the person who was receiving the award and such. Um, I don't know. It was just all about, you know, such a such a such a businesswoman, such a everything pushing them out of the home for it, no mentions of, of right. who they were in their home. And I was like, this is right. You know, this is a great opportunity to point to and how right. excellent a woman can be in her home, how she mm-hmm. she's out here doing this. But you should see her at home. That's where yeah. she's just a superstar. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, you pick your moments and you push that and you, um, you know, because we just like you just said in your introduction, it's we need to take advantage of media. We need to take yeah. advantage to to plant the flag for Christ mm-hmm. um, in the field in which he's placed you. Yeah. You know, Amen. so those are some some thoughts on it, though. Yeah, that's that's really good. And some people might be wondering, what are some of those strange beats in the background and stuff? Well, you're on a oh, tour bus. And, yes, and so there's, there's some... probably a sound check happening. Yeah, right there's a sound now. check. So, yes, sorry. sorry. About Just that. to explain, people will understand the yes. noises better. Um, okay, well, uh, la- last question here before I let you go. Um, you know, what do you, uh, how do you kind of keep that family? mentality as you guys are going out on the road you know you have a you have a single you have a little baby and you're going on you're touring around the u.s on a tour bus and and how are you able to kind of maintain that that uh, that family-centric vision of 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 the family in the midst of kind of kind of this life yeah um um well for one we have babies mm-hmm. yeah for right. two no, no you don't stop we, that yep yeah for two we baptize them for three, we take them to church. Yeah. And we raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And we um, are that for each other, me and Gabby. We're, um, you know, we're teammates on this thing and we're uh, pursuing Christ together. You know, I mean, even among all the spats and, and ugly stuff that happens, we confess our sins yeah. to each other and to God. We are trying to teach our children, or the one right now, to do it, you know, to. Yeah. Um, the, uh, like the canon press thing, you know, uh, the, I just love this phrase, the all of Christ for all of life, every bit of it's for our Lord. Um, Amen. um, and so, you know, that's how we win the world is through the family. We get that. Um, yeah. and so, I mean, it, just little things. I mean, we, we pray together before our meals. We, we eat together. Um, we, um, we live together. I mean, that's the whole thing. You know, when we first started, me and Gabby, we were doing separate careers and yep. pursuing it ourselves. And for the first couple of months, we were just gone. You know, yeah. she was never there. I was never, or I was gone. It was not matching up. Yeah. And so we were like, you know, we just do this together. And that's really been one of the greatest blessings because we can raise our children together. We have a, yeah. a 
you know, a home on wheels where we can eat together, pray together, live together for yeah. the glory of Christ. Um, you know, so it, it is about, I mean, you've got to set your focus there because again, that's a post that God has set you at. You've given you a wife and children and you're to lead them for me to lead them. Um, um, and to raise these babies uh, in a culture of Christ. Yeah. So, um, so how do you keep focused? Well, you, you keep focused on yeah. the things, you know, you, you, and you keep focused how God has ordained you to keep focus. That's right. As a leader reading of the God's family. Word. That's right. That's yeah. Right. Reading God's word, taking them to church, um, baptizing your babies, you Baptists. Yeah. <laughs> that is what <laughs> yeah. I love um, that game. Uh, hey, um, uh, uh, when are you guys are you guys coming out to Idaho or Washington anytime yeah. soon? I looked at your tour schedule and I'm like, oh, you guys aren't are coming we, close. We're not no, okay. So, I, I, well, I yeah, sometimes I don't know whether whether we will. There's a uh, new slot that's been put in. I, I uh, do what yeah. say again? Unless there's a new slot that's been put in that oh. I didn't see, but I don't know. Well, we we were gonna go till October. Um, and to her, but she got, uh, she got, uh, pregnant and we are going to try to take maternity leave at, at the end of August, I think. So we're not even okay. doing the, okay. the end there, but yeah, so um, but yeah I mean, Knoxville, Knoxville conference. Yes. Yes. Please come to the Knoxville conference, everybody. And I might be there hopefully. Um, <laughs> when is it? When is it by the way? It's it's October uh, 6th through the eighth in Knoxville. So six to the eight. Okay, I may be there because we'll, we'll not be doing anything. You and Gabby, you guys need a little R and R. Get out of get out yeah. of Nashville. Go to go to Knoxville. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Kate, I, I really appreciate your time, man. Thanks for coming on yeah. Water Break. Appreciate Thank you, brother. brother. Thank you, brother. So I said, and I mentioned this and reference this in my monologue that uh, the media has kind of, kind of given our network an assist. You know, they've they've kind of done the cancel culture thing. They aren't reporting on all the truth on on truth, and so that's allowed for platform. Uh, you know, shows like ours, um, our network, Cross Baltic, the shows on our network to kind of um, you know uh, get a voice uh, in in a in a very crowded media world, and I think the decentralization of media that has made alternative platforms like, you know, fight life, East cross Baltic possible successful as part of a larger trend and global shift. Um, I want to bring in uh, my teammate, uh, Rhett, Rhett Burns, uh, Rhett, what is that shift, uh, that is currently taking place? How do you see, uh, that shift and, and what is it looking like? I think over the next, you know, maybe 10, maybe even 20 years. Sure. I I think what we're seeing is a large scale decentralization that is going in, uh, across and affecting many sectors of our society. And so it's affecting finance and it's affecting uh, education and trade. And even we see it in some religious denominations. Um, and certainly we see that in media as uh, gate, uh, the age of gatekeepers is, is done and mm -hmm. anybody can be involved in media uh, via social media, via um, online writing, via podcasts and things like that. And so I think we see this wide scale decentralization. And, and then that is part of uh, what uh, Peter Zahan and his latest book, uh, currently reading that the, the end of the world is just the beginning where he charts the, the end of globalization. And so what he sees there is that the, the world of unprecedented wealth and connectivity uh, in the post World War II era that's you know mm. made possible by american power applied globally he says that that era is ending and there's an emerging world coming that's going to look much different and so uh you see things that are concerning ab about that like where's our food supply uh yeah. going to come from what about security we also see the rise of uh of localism and and regionalism becoming much more important as opposed to uh things at the national or global level and yeah. so we see that that world kind of coming up about. And what's interesting to me about that one is he, he points to demographic shifts, uh, most specifically the declining birth rate, what people up in, in your neck of the woods call the sandemic um, yeah. based on labor market reports and things like that. But what's super interesting to me is I'm uh, thinking back to a book. I think it was published back in the 90s by James Jordan called Crisis Opportunity in the Christian Future, in mm. which he saw this shift coming back then, not based on demographic or labor market reports, but based on his understanding of historical cycles um, based upon his you know, study of scripture and history. And, and so in that book, he, he talks about 
how history kind of goes in these cycles of tribes to an age of, of nations and then empires. And what he saw coming was uh, the end of the age of empire and back to a uh, an age of, of tribes. And what that says to me specifically as we, we think about media uh, today is uh, we're in or we're, we're re-entering a time of, of laying the foundations. And uh, that's specifically or especially important when it comes to media, because if we're laying the foundations and, and building a, a new world, uh, well, it's truth tellers and storytellers that win yeah. the future and build the future. Yeah. It, you know, it's interesting. Uh, so kind of you're, you're arguing for some sort of regionalization, uh, but there, all the all the pull and you know internet and travel and access uh, really does kind of lend towards a global opportunity uh, but why do you think it, despite kind of this this centripetal you know i don't know force if you want to call it that but this uh this pull with the internet being basically global why are we wanting to regionalize why are why are people kind of you know going back to community in some sense sure I think a couple of things. One, go, going back in this kind of historical cycle doesn't mean that we're going back in time. We're still going to have the internet. We're still going to be globally connected. Um, but w within that, we're going to see uh, we're going to see shifts. I think we we, we already see that. You take politically um, the the polarization, the the tribalization that we see mm -hmm. uh, in yeah. the political sphere. We're going to see that as people. Um, we talked about it last week, kind of uh, the reshuffling, the resorting of people, uh, whether that be within Christianity, within uh, the political uh, sphere. We're going to mm -hmm. see that happen, but we're still going to be connected with, via the Internet. And you're going to have some of those tribes that they're not going to be geographically um, necessarily together. But they're going to be connected online. At the same time, we are going to see, I think, um, this rise of regionalism and localism based ge geographically as well uh in this kind of new emerging world yeah which you know it's funny because i mean actually our whole constitution was set up to be a kind of a regional government um with a small federal government and the goal and i think part of the wisdom behind that is actually kind of um relieves tension and disagreement Idaho can be Idaho, Washington can be Washington to a certain extent, um, but when you when you concentrate everything at federal power, a, a, you know you, when you federalize everything, it actually creates a a um, it heightens the distrust and it heightens the uh, political arguments and it heightens I think the the political wars, uh, and so states' rights in, in a lot of ways the states were set up to kind of be a a, a relief valve for kind of that that political uh, mechanism. So we wouldn't be so polarized constantly like we are right now. Uh, but we, since we've gotten away from that kind of regionalization, to use your terminology, um, uh, we actually have a, a heightened uh, political um, pressure cooker that's boiling right now. And we really, getting back to states' rights would really kind of relieve some of that pressure cooking tension, if that makes sense. How should Christians be thinking about this emerging world before us and what's going on. Sure. I think a couple of things. One is uh, anything that's new, anything that's unsettling, uh, obviously raises raises lots of questions, maybe raises concerns, maybe raises anxiety. And I think we need to be careful not to despair. We need to have a strong uh, doctrine of God's sovereignty and, and God's providence, that he's put us here in this moment, in this moment in history uh, for a reason. And he works all things for good. That doesn't necessarily mean that everything's going to be easy. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have hardship, but we need to remember what the Bible says. Think of Romans 5. Uh, suffering is productive. It produces endurance. It produces character, produces yeah. hope. And so we need to not despair, but lean into the times that God has put us in. We also need to remember, um, you know, going back to that James Jordan book in the title of it, Crisis and Opportunity. We have a huge opportunity before us as this new world emerges right. and, and things um, are being built. We, we have a big opportunity to lay the foundations for the new world, for uh, to build the next Christendom. And so we need to be very purposeful, be very careful about what we're building and build it right. And so we need to invest specifically in people uh, in this time with declining birth rates and, uh, and things like that, which is leading to all sorts of our economic issues uh, with the labor market just kind of being depleted. Uh, we need to remember that people are our most important 
resource. So we need to really focus in on our families. We need to really focus in on our churches. We need to remember that that uh, Christians, we have a distinct advantage. If we are entering, to use Jordan's terminology, back into the age of tribes, we have a really big advantage because the church is the true tribe. We yeah. have our common uh, view of the world. We have our common uh, book, our common festivities in the in Lord's Day worship, our common songs in the Psalms. And we need to really lean into that and focus on the people because that is our most important resource. And then one other thing that I would add is just just knowing is half the battle, knowing what's coming. So you're not caught off guard. So yeah. you're not surprised. Knowing leads to preparation and then preparation leads to confidence. And so that's what we need. We need we need confident Christians who are ready to build uh, the new world. That's really helpful. Thank you, Rhett, for joining us on Water Break, man. Lord bless you. You as well. Thanks, man. All right. So when you're talking about media, you always got to bring a comedian in on this. Okay, because comedians, they they take the brunt of kind of cancel culture and kind of uh, the the they kind of embody the the hard work ethic that it takes to, I think, get into media to break through a lot of the um, uh, uh, challenges that media presents. So I, I want to bring in uh, teammate comedian John Branion. And, oh, uh, I, have, I have something important to do this week, don't I? You didn't tell me that. You do, you do. Actually, we're actually not. We aren't. We don't have time today to hit uh, news that John Brandy can trust. But I, I wanted to hit this with you first because um, okay. we're talking about we're talking about media, mm -hmm. and you know, of course, media can include. Uh, you, you have the the pipeline of media, the social media. You know, you have uh, uh, movies, Netflix, um, cable TV, podcasts, kind of the pipelines of, of how you get media out. And then you have the various media styles. You have comedy news, um, uh, you know, uh, hunting shows, you have all these various, um, uh, sermons, uh, can be very much part of that media. Um, and so comedy though, we've talked about this a little bit before in the past, but, um, comedy is a, a, actually a pretty strategic form of, of media that that Christians tend to largely kind of neglect. Uh, why why is comedy so strategic? You think in this discussion? Uh, well, because comedy is succinct, and uh, and you can say you can say true things really quickly in a way that uh, everybody understands, and that's that's the reason that comedians get in trouble. It's because they are <laughs> they are so succinct and they are so good at expressing ideas that everybody knows exactly what they're what they're talking about. And uh, it's not buried underneath a bunch of uh, subterfuge and unnecessary chatter. So that's good. You know, why do you think, uh, you know, when I think of comedy and I think of part of uh, some of its strategic um, way of communicating, it's also I think I, I totally agree with your point about it being succinct, but it's also kind of a. Uh, everyone wants to laugh. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone likes to to laugh. I, I I don't think I've ever met a person who doesn't like to laugh. And so, uh, and from that sense, also, it's kind of a common, you know, language uh, across the world that makes it strategic too. Right. Well, everybody wants to laugh, but uh, but they want to laugh at certain things. The 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 thing that comedy has to be, no matter what form it is, is it has to be true. And that's also that's the right. reason that people get into trouble. That the reason some comedians get into trouble. Not all comedians. Not all comedians get canceled. Um, yeah. Some of them, some of them ride the wave of popularism to to great fortune and fame. Um, and, but the ones who consistently tell the truth, those are the ones who are getting into trouble. And they don't even necessarily have to identify as Christians. Christians are the ones who who always tell the truth. Um, yeah. But even the even the secular comics, even the non-believers, once in a while, can say things that are true, mm -hmm. and that's it, you can just watch the culture. You can watch our culture that loves that loves evil and darkness. And when they get annoyed with a comedian, that's a person that you probably should spend some time paying attention to because odds are they're saying something true. Yeah, we call that a blind squirrel finding a nut. Right. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does happen. A blind, yeah, a blind comedian occasionally stumbles over the truth, and yeah. uh, and the and the culture is really good at detecting that. They start to shriek and scream, and you go, "Oh, this must be a guy who's saying something that I can probably trust." It's always yeah. always a good idea to go in the opposite direction of culture. If the culture is upset about something, right. then you can pretty much know, "All right, I should probably support this." 
Now, why have uh, I mean? There's a lot of Christian comedians out there, um, but it it's kind of I would say a little more of an underground. Um, uh, you know, Christians don't tend to get involved in comedy. Christians don't tend to emphasize comedy. Christians, in some sense, I guess at some level, maybe um, you could argue that Christians maybe have abandoned uh, uh, comedy at, at some level. And of course, you got some notable Christian comedians out there. Um, most of them are probably in rehab at this point. But um, <laughs> which, which is why nobody's heard of me, Gabe. Because I haven't been. You've never been to rehab. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got to make headlines with some scandal. Yeah, yeah. Why? Why have Christians maybe, let's say, at least not focused on uh, the comedy? Uh, because it's a it's a conflict of interest, um, and the the challenge is: Am I going to do what is going to advance my career, or am am I going to do and say what uh, brings glory to God? And so mm. it's a it's a conflict of interest, and it's really difficult to strike that balance. I have not um, been a hundred percent successful in my career of of finding that it's not even really a balance. That's the problem. You're supposed to do everything we do according to Scripture is supposed to be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything in that's word right. or in deed, and so that's the only way to be successful as a human being. And being successful as a comedian, it's very easy to get distracted with um, trying to make people laugh, which is basically seeking the approval and the applause of men. I mean, that's literally what it is. Yeah. And so yeah. if, if you're going to be, it, it's, a, it's a weird line to walk because we're supposed to do everything with excellence and we're supposed to do it so that God is glorified. But yeah. when you're doing it, and music is this way too, and even preaching to a certain extent, if you're doing it well so that people are appreciating it, it yeah. puts you in kind of a weird position because now it's like, okay, am, am I doing this for, am I elevating myself or, or is God still getting the credit for this? It's, yeah. it's tough. It's hard to do. Yeah. I, I understand that tension. Um, you know, I mean, I, I would say anybody who's producing media, they want the attention of the masses, you know, sure. I mean, we want as many people to tune in to cross politic or water break as possible. I mean, I mean, that's, um, I, I think a noble goal. And, but if you're, uh, if you're doing that for self-serving purposes, that's, that's where the problem comes in. So you can, you can do it well. And I, I think part of what needs to happen is sometimes we can, we can process this so internally and where, where we think through so internally, we kind of get uh, bound, wound up so tight that it's hard for us to function. You know, we're wanting to, right. we're wanting to get a big crowd and we're, wanting to glorify God. And we are also not wanting to uh, lift ourselves up above his name or lift ourselves up and become a, some sort of, you know, superstar personality in a way that you just, you've ruined the whole vision of what you set out to do in the first place. <laughs> right. Right. And How, reading, no. well, just reading about uh, John, about John the Baptist and that dude was a celebrity, you know, he came yep. along and, and he was, he was like, okay, I'm not even worthy to untie the sandals of the guy that's coming along behind me, but still yeah. people didn't believe him. You know, there were still people who wanted to, who wanted to make him equal with the prophets. They wanted him to be the Messiah. So, so it's been a thing that's been a challenge for, for celebrities for, mm -hmm. you know, since the beginning, if you, if you attract, if you win the favor of, of people, um, you, you always have to make sure that, as much as possible, you keep shoving, you keep pointing at Christ. You keep going, no, 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 please, please stop. Please stop with the accolades um, yeah. because I don't deserve it. And yeah. I, I appreciate it. I understand. It's it's such a tight rope to walk because people, if they appreciate what you do, if they're Christian people, well, then it is, it is correct for them to say, hey, thank you for what you did. I appreciated it. It has been a blessing to me. And so yeah. We just have to. We just have to beg God to make us wise when we, uh, when we start to succeed mightily in media. Right. We have right. to pray. We have to praise God for that and just beg Him to keep us wise. Yeah. Now, uh, now um, you know, one of the things I would, I uh, would like to do is encourage more Christians to get into comedy. What you know, you got a, a fourteen year old aspiring dude who who's got some you know quick gifts and that kind of thing. How do you encourage? families how do you encourage that young man to yeah you know get into comedy here's how you need to do it here's what you need to be thinking about here's how you practice here's how you start 
uh, heading down that path? Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm, I have a different answer to that question than I had 15 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I would say that you, if, if you're going to survive, if you're going to make it as a comedian, uh, be, be plugged deeply into your tribe, your local, your local tribe. Yeah. Um, your church. If you don't have a church, that's step one. Get a church that's going to hold you accountable for your material. It's going to mm -hmm. hold you accountable for the way you live. If you do start to become successful, there's somebody who's going to constantly be monitoring you um, and making sure that you are not wandering off the path. Yeah. Um, and when you're first starting out, you need people who are going to be honest with you about your about your skills. Um, yeah. I, I had I grew up basically being told that I was funny. I mean, from the time I was a little kid, people, strangers, and you know, oh, you're you're funny, yeah. um, and that's one thing. When you when you start to hear that from different people, and it needs to be different sources, not just your mom and dad. It needs yeah. to be other people voluntarily saying, "Oh, you're a funny person." Um, then you can start to go, "Okay, well, there must be some truth to that." Yeah. Uh, and then moving forward, you need people who will be honest with you about uh, about how you're doing. That's yeah. the that's the other thing that's really difficult to find, particularly in church families, because church people are, are supposed to, they're supposed to love you um, and be you nice. Just, uh, they're yeah. supposed to be nice yeah. to you and they're supposed yeah. to encourage you. And church yeah. people have got encouragement down pat. But encouragement <laughs> is not always useful. Encouragement yeah, is not funny. always truthful. Right, so right. you need to find somebody who will genuinely encourage you by telling you, hey, that's not that's not right. That's not good. That's not funny. Um, no. And but just but just be open and honest. I, I, acknowledge it. If God's made you funny, that's a gift. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Laughter is a gift from God and yeah. uh, he deserves a credit for it. And yeah. then just just find a tribe, find a local tribe that will help you be uh, accountable to what really really yeah. matters which is just bringing glory to god if you yeah. I, I i can i can go for stories after story of of people who were christian people when they started out and they were really good comics but mm -hmm. they went to counsel with people who were outside of the family they were outside of the body of of christ yeah. and they're not christians anymore um oh. the the they are they're wandering off and yeah. uh and it's because they were not connected to the right tribe that's right, that's right. Hey, comedian John Brandon, thank you so much, man, for joining this conversation. Appreciate you. And, My pleasure. Uh, no plus. So think of media as a tool. Uh, you know, Swiss Army knife with kind of vast amounts of uses. Uh, this tool can uh, include social media. You know, kind of cable, you know, theaters, radio, podcasting, you know, it's this tool. And 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 any other avenue that you can think of there for that. And and this tool can reach into everyone's house, everyone's phone, everyone's car, and the world, you know, the the whole world. You can drop a podcast here in northern Idaho where we're at, and it can reach, you know people in Australia or Japan or, or, you know, the whole world again, uh, wherever technology allows. Let's work on employing this tool with wisdom for God's glory and, and the good of the world. And with your gifts and your abilities, you know, comedian, pastor, uh, host, you know, show, uh, whatever God's given you. Um, and, and a lot of you out there, God might have given you just administrative abilities and all this. Um, networking abilities. Maybe you aren't the face of, of the show or the moot or, or, or whatever, um, but figure out how with your gifts and your abilities to employ this tool. Don't let's not be scared of, of, of this tool. So, well, this is the water boy with water break until next week. Go fight, laugh and feast. When tyrants take over, what's the first thing they do? Disarm. It happened in Russia, China, Germany, and most recently, Afghanistan. Why? Because disarmed people are easier to control. And over the last century and a half, American tyrants have been carrying out a slow, methodical disarmament that no one is talking about. State education. Tyrants know that education is warfare. Our rulers have a vested interest in making you totally harmless. They've got big plans and they don't want you getting in the way. Think about it. 
Would you rather fight an army decked out with high-powered rifles or a bunch of dinky water pistols? They know that if you can think critically, you're a threat. At New St. Andrews College, we want to graduate men and women who are dangerous. Dangerous to the world, dangerous to the principalities and powers, dangerous to spiritual wickedness in high places. Education can either arm you or disarm you. It can make you a threat or make you a useful idiot. <laughs> so, where you get that education counts. Click the link to apply to New St. Andrews College today. Home. It's where you build your legacy, where traditions are started, seeds are planted, meals are shared, and stories are told. We are Chris Natalie Carpenter, owners of Story Real Estate, and our team of top agents helps people find homes in Moscow, Idaho, and around the country. Have you thought about a move? Contact us to get connected with a top agent who shares your values and puts your family first. Or reach out to us about our Moscow Relocation Guide. Wherever you're looking to go, we can help you find home. Call us at Story Real Estate or visit us at storyrealestate.com and start building your legacy.